Welcome to the final Policy and Equity Committee meeting of 2021. It has been awesome, uh, this makeup of this committee with Mr. Lindy and Ms. Bolton. I do believe we have done some really excellent things this year, and uh, I will miss the makeup of this committee. I just wanted to start by saying that. I really, uh, I think we've brought uh, three different skill sets, uh, three different personalities, and it has resulted in some solid policies for the district. So thanks to everyone that's tuned in this year. And um, we'll see you in the new year. And we hope you enjoy uh, your holiday break, which begins very soon. Um, so uh, as we always do, we'll start with a round of introductions for the folks you see up here. And we'll start to my right with Ms. Scott. <laughs> there we go. Stephanie Scott, Assistant General Counsel. Dan Horn, General Counsel. Ben Lindy, Board Member. Mike Moroski, board member. Uh, East Bolton, board member. All right. So, um, unfortunately, um, I, I need to leave for some uh, family reasons uh, fairly soon. Um, so, I'm going to move around the agenda just a little bit, and then um, board member Bolton will assume my uh, chairpersonship um, after that. So, um, if we could, if we could just move agenda item three uh, first. This is open enrollment. And the last meeting, we had an awesome discussion, I thought, about it. Probably the best since I've been on the board. And um, we had asked for some costs, like, you know, does this co are we making money on open enrollment? Are we losing it for the edification of the public? Open enrollment is a process by which people who do not live within the CPS district can send their kids to our schools. Um, we had asked uh, about could Cincinnati Digital Academy be kept open enrollment if we closed open enrollment entirely? Um, and then we had asked uh, some questions about boundary lines in neighborhood schools. So I'll turn it over to... Uh, General Counsel's Office. Great, thank you. Um, included in your packet this uh, month is uh, our open enrollment policy as well as the Ohio Revised Code statute that uh, relates to um, what, what school districts are able to do with respect to an open enrollment. Um, I'll just address the cost issue first. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit difficult to tell whether it, um, th th there's different measures that we can use to determine whether or not uh, to do a financial analysis of open enrollment. Uh, one would be, uh, and this is pretty easy, easily shown on our uh, uh, sort of settlement statement with the state, uh, whether we have a net, um, so we receive uh, payments from other districts when a student from another district enrolls in CPS. And we lose a payment for a student from CPS who enrolls in another school district. So um, ODE, for example, uh, in their settlement statement in 2021, calculated that we had a net positive adjustment of 5.4 million and a negative adjustment of 3.7. So net, it looks like we were up about one. Um, do the math here, um, a little less than $2 million. Um, similar for 2022, as of now, ODE, according to our settlement statement, has us at 5.3 million net positive and negative uh, uh, minus uh, 3.6. So again, about 1.9 1. 1. or so million dollars. So that, that's one way of, of analyzing, in general, if the school district has vacant seats that are unused by resident students and we're not adding a significant amount of staff, there, there is some net positive, presumably, to uh, having open enrollment. But that, that's sort of as far as I've gone so far. That's helpful for me. Yep, Ben. Um, I know just enough about this to be dangerous and unhelpful. Um, so I'm going to preface my comments with that. But I, I'm, the, thing I, the thing I hear in this analysis is on like at an aggregate level, we bring in more than we send out when it comes to the moment. I think the thing that's tricky about that is it doesn't take into account costs. Um, and, and I think that like I keep thinking about this in terms of dollars spent per kid. And if, if you just make a really simple ex example, imagine we spend $100 for 10 students in CPS. That's $10 per kid. 
if we instead bring in an extra dollar and an extra student, that's $101 over 11. And 101 over 11 is actually less than 100 over 10. If my math is right. So what's happening is we're spending less per kid overall in the district, even though we're bring, technically bringing in more than we're sending in. So again, I know just enough about this to be unhelpful in because there may be huge errors in the math that I just did. Uh, I want to preemptively say that. Um, but, but it seems like the way to look at it is how much do we spend per kid in the current open enrollment setting? What would we have spent per kid if we had no open enrollment? And, and my hypothesis is that we're going to be spending more per kid with no open enrollment because we don't get any of the local property taxes that come in with the kids that come in. We only get the state share, I think, right? I think that's right. Um, and again, I, I know no, no just enough. I, I forget how you said it, just enough to be unhelpful. But uh, under the former system, my understanding was we received an unreduced state share from that other district. So whereas when we receive a state share for our students, it's reduced by our local, some factor that represents our local. My understanding is under the former system, we received an unreduced state share if we received the kids from another. I, I have to say, in talking to even Kevin Ashley, our, our financial um, reporting, director yesterday. Uh, this is a topic of conversation on almost every OASBO that the admins, uh, school administrators uh, association. Uh, every school district that has open enrollment is now looking under the new state formula, whether they'll be net net hurt or harm. Uh, Kevin has advised that th there's new data coming out. They, they promised it in December. He expects it uh, any any time, and so he may have more analysis on this as we see, you know, what happens with the new is, is there is a? I don't mean to cut anybody off. Um, what what's the? I'm trying to understand timing on this. Like, if this were to change, when would we need to do that? Because it, it might be that none of this is urgent, or it could be super urgent. Sure. Yeah, and, and that gets into some of the other changes you asked us to look into. For, um, for example, whether or not you know we could we could identify just one school, Cincinnati Digital Academy, you mentioned as open enrollment. I, my, my thinking is that timing-wise, um, you know, open enrolled students are the last to be admitted uh, uh -huh. in our enrollment sequence. So uh, not until uh, almost the summer do we start to look at rolling new open. -enrolled. The biggest issue, I think, would be we have currently enrolled open sure. enrollment students, and, so we'd have to decide what to do. Yeah, and it might be that there's like a gradual wind down. Anybody who's currently here can continue. Like, I, I'm not advocating for anything humane. I just, and, and I also think that, you know, the finances are one important part of open enrollment. Uh, I also, you know, um, I kind of like this idea that we'd be happy to take your kids if you take our kids. Um, approach, you know, um, but, but all, all, I think my, my request would just be, um, by blank date, and I'm not sure when that date is, we could figure it out. Like, could, could we see this done by per, per student? Like, what, what, then it might be something for Jen's office, but what's the, what's the expenditure per kid in CPS currently? Uh, it, it, total, like including, uh, federal funds, including, um, State funds, including local funds, and then imagine a district where we didn't have open enrollment. What's what's the expenditure per kid in that scenario? Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. You good this one? Good. Mm -hmm. Good Paul. Uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate um, Mr. Lindy's <clears throat> comments and. Uh, the open enrollment piece, uh, I think there were two board members, Kathy Ingram and myself, that resisted this for three years, especially during as we were coming through the FMP. Um, you know, we needed enrollment because we had dipped so low during that transition. Uh, but um, I right now am much more supportive of it. Um, 
couple of reasons. One, um, and maybe this is, I hate to see this as an assignment, but I'd like to really see a, 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 a report that shows us from where do these kids come. Because if it adds to our diversity, if it somehow is speaking to the fact that we do a better job than most school districts with special ed kids, or that we are really more of a center for our immigrant and refugee uh, kids in this general vicinity that's usually pretty conservative about that kind of stuff. I'd like to, I'd like to see the makeup. Uh, and I think the, I think the core, I think the, uh, to Mr. Lindy's point, I think the, 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 um, the court's still out on how much money we make or don't make on this. I do know that people in other districts we are helping them survive with the exodus of our kids. So I'm glad now to see that at least we're more than breaking even on that because we were bleeding terribly on the west side and in the north central uh, to districts that were open enrollment and our kids were fleeing there. So there's a it's sort of a defensive mood, you know, it's a, a land, sea, and air kind of approach. So I have an interest in that, but most particularly what kind of kids and where are they coming from and for what reason might they be coming. And I think we deal okay with the issue of uh, our citizens' children, our taxpayers' uh, kids have to have first dibs. But I think um, as we look at enrollment, school by school by school, we have plenty of seats. We're not where we were even three years ago where, and granted, where we're crowded is in our most, uh, at least publicly acknowledged successful school. So that's where the real rip comes. Uh, but then again, I also um, think that if we do things right, we can, we can certainly uh, make more of our schools uh, look and be successful publicly. And to uh, Mr. Lindy's point about the, um, how do we, what do we spend by student? Uh, Mr. Morawski, I think, made a, a request of the treasurer that the treasurer talked to, to me about, about comparing two different schools and, the, and whatever. And the reason it was a great request, and I, I won't say which school, um, but it, it, the reason she even told me about it is that it's part of the new budget process, that what she has started with now is let's look at the funding at the school. And we always start with the schools, but not to the level that she started, where you're going to know by grade level, by school, by whatever, all funds included, how much we're spending at virtually every school per kid. And she's also doing some great comparison work on staffing. So that's kind of interesting, too. Do we have too few teachers or too many? Or do we oversell the support team, whatever? So I think we'll be getting all of that. And Mr. Lindy and I always have this little, uh, about every few months this comes up, uh, and I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good conversation to have. Um, our best educational program is not having fewer kids. And this is what we, do. Mr. Lindy and I tend to kind of have a discussion about, and I enjoy the discussion. Because so much of our funding and expenditure depends upon scale. If you have too many small schools, you cannot staff them. So either you're going to be consolidating schools or you're going to have to be finding ways to enroll more kids in some of those schools. Or you're not going to have a music and art teacher like we thought for 12 years to get in every school or something. So scale is part of it. It isn't just that we could spend more dollars on fewer kids. Not really, because you're going to have fewer of everything especially at the site level. So this is this something as part of the finance. But I think we're I think uh, the chair is right to emphasize this at this time since we had that report. Uh, and then also since it's a great discussion even as part of what some people have talked about like the, the Meridian things, you sort of look to self reorganize. This could be part of it as well. The uh, last thing I'm interested to know where the, the kids are that are coming, exactly which schools they're going to. Okay, good. Thank you. Good. And I do think there's a time pressure uh, 
that we have to make the policy for next year rather than I don't I even though we're the, the open enrollment are the last people to find out in the in the cycle, I still think you people start a year with a particular policy. It's kind of confusing for the general public to change the policy before. Although there are some times when we must do that. I think it's a great discussion to have. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. For now? Eve? Yeah. Okay. Um, what was the, uh, was there any outcome with the, uh, like, piecemeal Cincinnati Digital Academy thing idea? Yeah, so if I can share my screen. Yeah. Uh, I had a lengthy discussion with Connie Solano, who has uh, some experience in this area as well. Um, and there were two specific questions I think we had yesterday. One were at the last policy meeting. One was, if the board were to decide, to decide, for example, I think, um, to open in, to allow open enrollment at, let's say, just one school, such as the example used with Cincinnati Digital Academy, is that lawful? Is that, is that something the board could do? And then the second question I think I got was, are we allowed to, uh, pick and choose the districts that we open enrollment to? So, in other words, can we do like a quid pro quo quote? I, by, at least my initial research, and I'm not reached out to ODE on this, um, but based on my analysis of the statute, the answer to question, the first question I believe would be yes, we could open up to specific programs or schools and not to others. Mm. And the answer to question two is likely no, we can't pick and choose which districts. And uh, looking at the screen, it's a little tough to see, but this is, this is from uh, Ohio Revised Code 3313.38. And it directs boards of education to pick one of three policies with respect to open enrollment. It says each board, uh, a city board of education shall adopt a resolution establishing for the school district one of the following policies. A, a policy that entirely prohibits enrollment from adjacent districts or other districts. B, a policy that permits enrollment from all adjacent districts, so all districts that touch our boundaries. Uh, in accordance with policy statements contained in the resolution, or C, a policy that permits enrollment of students from all of this. So, as I read the statute, we have to pick between one of those three. Um, that would suggest that saying that, yes, we'll open enrollment to Three Rivers because they open enroll our students, but no, we won't open enroll with Marymount because they have closed enrollment. Uh, I, that doesn't, I think, fit within one of these three choices. On the other hand, the question about Cincinnati Digital Academy, again, this does give the board discretion because it says our policy shall be passed and, and then in accordance with policy statements contained in the resolution. That does give the board some discretion about how to administer an open enrollment policy. And I will say, to some extent, we are already doing that because when a school is uh, has no vacancies, we have said to a family that wants to open enroll in that school, there are no vacancies in that school. So we are, in some ways, already picking and choosing what schools are available. That's that's kind of our initial analysis. Uh, we would probably want to make sure with ODE that we were on firm ground before we drafted a resolution. So that's that's our analysis. Interesting. Okay. Um, Again, this is just history, but you know, I've been appointed as a historian at this point in time by the state. Um, and I, I welcome that uh, assignment. Um, when we first did this open enrollment, I thought you had to have open enrollment statewide. That, that is my understanding of the selection the board made. Our policy is consistent right now with C, a policy that permits enrollment of students from all districts in accordance with policy statements. And, and all districts in the state of Ohio. Correct. That's what okay. that, yes. So that really is the value of growing CDA, if we could ever get it, our, you know, ducks in a row to expand sure. it to the level that it needs to be expanded. I mean, I think that's part of the vision, even when we started open enrollment, was having a digital academy 
because we've been witnessing all this corruption and what have you in other digital uh, schools, schools in the state of Ohio. We thought we could really compete if we could do it, since we were ahead of most people even then, technologically. So, okay, yes, yeah, it's everybody in the state. Thank you. Which it sounds like we could, if we ever wanted to go this route, and I'm not entirely there's consensus to change much right now, which I didn't expect there to be, but if we wanted to go the route of CDA being like the one and only, we could do that for everyone in the state and make CDA, it could be have 20,000 people in it, but every other school would be closed. Okay, great, thanks. That is interesting. Um, okay, Mr. Lindy? No, I just want to make sure I understood. So, so it's, we could do the thing where we opened up our district to any other district, but only in CDA. That's cool. What's not cool is we're going to open up to um, Lachlan, but not Indian Hill. That, that's, that's the way I read. It's either no, no open enrollment, open enrollment to everyone in the state, which is what we have right now, or the third option is open enrollment only to adjacent which we have a lot more than just that many. There's, I don't know, who did and adjacent to it. I mean, we, we, could, we could say we will absolutely open up once all of those adjacent districts have decided. Oh, I was saying, like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think through this equity piece, you know, and, and how, um, uh, it, it can, I don't, this is untested and this could be wrong, but if it's true that kids are coming into Walnut or SDPA for some of our selective enrollment higher performing high schools, of which I'm an alum and a very loyal alum, um, but kids in Madisonville who would like to go to Indian Hill, that is a much shorter drive than the drive they're currently taking and a higher performing school, but they exclude them because they don't like the kids from CPS. I, I that doesn't work for me. You know, and so I was, I was just trying to understand is there some, is there some legal mechanism by which we could actually say we would love to collaborate, but it's got to be collaboration everywhere. Um, and, and what I'm, what I'm hearing is like, we couldn't write that in the policy, but we could just wait to pass the policy until all of those other districts have, have said. I think that's right. I, there's one other point. I think this is obvious, but the, if the board decides to change its open enrollment policy, that that doesn't change our students, resident students' ability to go to another district that's open enrollment. So we, in other words, that that financial chart from ODE, if, if we suddenly decided to stop open enrollment, we, we we could still potentially be losing kids and funding. Yeah, okay, just. <laughs> This is an interesting conversation. I look forward to um, debriefing it uh, with the full board. And then Dan, I may, I understand it pretty good. And I think between you, myself, and Ben, we can relay the information. I may call you up. I know this is like a month out or whatever. But because um, I think the rest of the board needs to know it. And by the time that these minutes are presented, we're going to have three new board members. Um, and, you know, just for me, as I know Dan knows and this committee knows, this is a while maybe not the most important issue on our plate, I do think it's a big, you know, it's a big issue, or issue, it's a big facet of our district that I know I, I was woefully unaware of or uneducated about when I got here. So thank you for all this, appreciate it. Um, and then um, we'll move on to, unless there anything else, Ben? Yeah. Um, I've dropped like the Mr. and Mrs. stuff, uh, meeting of the year. It's like we're all buddies. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, hey, buddy. Uh, what's next on the agenda? Um, so this will be my last one. I apologize, everybody, but I am going to have to go for some family matters, and Ms. Bolton will assume the chairpersonship. Uh, continued discussion of sub policies for vaccination. And that one was put on here. I think was it Mr. Lindy or Ms. Bolton that wanted to continue talking? I thought it was maybe it was all of us really. So, I think it was it was just for me it was just a very specific issue of not just extracurricular but also those staff members and students that have to work so closely together, particularly 
the medically fragile students, if there's any guidance from anywhere. Well, I think in some of the research we had shared before, there are districts throughout the country um, that does have a subset um, for a vaccination policy on, on student athletes. So I think we discussed that last time as far as extracurriculars. I guess it's just a matter of determining whether we want to go that route. We do have some information, I guess, that we'll share once we get to that section um, of the agenda that the um, athletics has shared with us as far as how they've been, um, how they've been monitoring incidences within our athletics. But um, so there is precedent, I guess, across the country that there is a subset um, based on athletics. And then as far as our students and staff that are kind of working, I guess, more so in a medical environment, our staff would already be under the vaccination policy that we have in place for employees. But we do have some students, I think, that are doing some internships through our, like, our ICANN program, and those students are vaccinated, and they would have to do that okay. at the beginning. So um, it sounds like they were covered there. So. Yeah, that sounds good. And I, I, my concern is that so many of our staff members uh, do have, um, even that are instructional leaders and instructional providers, um, do work very closely physically with the kids that may have issues. And I just worry that our staff is vaccinated, but still, as we also know, you can be vaccinated and you're still getting this thing. So that has started to change some of my thought about about at least the people that are in close proximity. But we, we know enough about the athletic teams, but the point is well taken that staff that are working in that close contact with students are are there. But I just some way to encourage to make sure those kids are vaccinated, even if it's I, I don't want to necessarily make a policy, but I think we in fairness to our staff, we need to be aware of that. I just admire the people that do that on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I don't like to add risk to an already trying assignment. I don't have any, I don't have any interest in moving ahead on any of that, sure. but I, I do think that's an HR issue that should be addressed, maybe, maybe not policy. I'll just add that, that it, it comes up from time to time. We do so many internships, co-op programs, yeah. kids working on site. And, um, you know, part of the education of that is that these employers or places of work or whatever, they, they have requirements that, you know, we teach our kids and help our kids to meet those requirements. And, and that's not just, I mean, it can be vaccination issues at, at a medical center. It can be background check issues that, you know, again, these aren't our requirements, but help our kids navigate that and, and we've got folks at Woodward who we work with on that. Um, so, you know, each kind of employer that we work with, as we broaden that circle, we, we kind of show our kids, this is, these are the things you need, the credentials you need, the qualifications that you need to be able to work with. Ben? You good? Okay. Um, I appreciate uh, that we have talked about this so much this year. I hope the policy committee next year, um, whoever's on it, um, continues these conversations because, you know, not to be the Debbie Downer as I often can be, but, you know, the, the numbers regarding this virus are out of control right now. And I don't think these conversations are going anywhere. I don't think the student vaccination conversation is done. Um, we're getting at least a hundred more per day than last week and then a hundred more per day than the week before that. And it just keeps. It's freaky, uh, and so I appreciate that this committee has kept it up, and the health and you know health and safety has as well. So um, thanks for all this good work, Dan, and we'll uh, we'll definitely tee up whoever uh, is on the policy committee next year. will have a lot of good stuff to get rocking. So um, with that, thanks you all for an awesome year, Ben and Eve. It's been it's been great, and I know I'll see you guys soon, and I'll see you all soon too. So, Chairwoman, it's up to you. Is it is it appropriate if we just thank Mike for a quick second before he heads out? I, I won't take forever. I just uh, it's my first time on the policy committee. I think you run a tight meeting. It's been great being here, and I feel like we've gotten a lot done. So thank you, and happy holidays. See you, buddy.
uh, as we're doing this, uh, rather than necessarily just go with the where we are, because you know I do want to be talking a lot about the transportation and boundary lines, but uh, I'd rather also see it. Uh, I would rather also get through some of the agenda items that are quick, rather than um, lengthy, if that works. So, General Counsel, if you can uh, direct us to what could be quick on this agenda, so neither you or the Assistant General Counsel. That would be helpful. Uh, well, quickly, uh, with respect to some requests for additional boundary line maps, um, I understand finance is looking at that as well. Uh, Jeremy Gallagher prepared maps for the board that were in the board packets about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. We're, we're calling them red dot maps. It's every school, and it's it shows where every student residents who attend right. that school. So we didn't reprint those for you. We certainly have them if any board member needs them. Then we also, again, included the maps uh, aligned to the city neighborhoods. Um, anything else further needed on that? Obviously, that's going to be a continued discussion. But It is going to be a continued discussion. I was uh, able to get from the county. It's not what I really wanted totally, but from the cages people in the county, the neighborhood boundary lines that are neighborhood boundary lines and then also those that are in dispute between the community councils, which is okay. Uh, I, I, as a former neighborhood leader, I want that disputes are real. Um, but the, um, uh, so there's several versions of it. There's the one that's recognized by the city the boundary lines. There's ones that are recognized by the community council, including the disputed ones. And then there are neighborhood boundary lines that are part of uh, the traditional census. What I am interested in, in uh, this, because I think finance is going to be spending much of its time on transportation in the next three months, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, I'm interested in actually visually seeing where the boundary lines for each of our, particularly our um, elementary schools, our neighborhood schools, how they match up with the either, you know, um, uh, let's see, how they, let's say this, how they match up with the actual neighborhood in which the school is located. Uh, Mr. Messer and, 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 and uh, uh, Mr. Davis and I even kind of talked about, we say, okay, uh, such and such school in, and then you list the neighborhood as part of kind of the branding, kind of part of their marketing. So I'd like the administration to be able to show me and this committee how the bound attendance lines match up with the city neighborhood boundary lines. And that would also then include, we have to get Amberley, obviously, and, and Silverton and Cheviot. In those places that are outside the city, but my first concentration would be um, the neighborhood themselves, neighborhood schools themselves, because I really feel that there are aspects of um, our organization and our current enrollment and our current issues regarding transportation that could be addressed if indeed there was a higher definition of neighborhood associated with our attendance boundaries and our attendance boundaries were drawn under conditions that are not acceptable any longer either because dating way back part of this was to secure particular diversity and um, particular uh, inclusion based on race and there are aspects of that that there's some issues uh, as to whether or not that's appropriate and the sociological issue is that we have neighborhoods that are very much uh, integrated, but our schools are not because they are perceived as having such a high level of poverty. So there's a whole bunch of things that are really important. Um, and there's been so much change. I mean, if you tell us when the boundary lines were first drawn or most recently drawn, with the exception of Pan, you, it's not the same city. It's not, and a city that has a reputation for so much poverty, child poverty, 
in a city that has such a reputation for being such a segregated city. We need to look at this because it's impacting our mem it's our uh, daily membership, if you will, and it's impacting our ability to market our schools. And I think it's um, it, it needs to happen. And I would bet you that things could be tra transitioned into if we guaranteed the people that where they are now, well, to Mr. Lindy's point about open enrollment, if we're guaranteeing transition, we're going to have some community involvement, but the district is in an urgent need to reorganize itself, especially with the situation of regional transportation. But more particularly is that there's a great need to uh, reorganize the district in a way that is not losing choice, but is finding a way to sustain itself. Because right now we're not we're not in a sustainable, and we haven't been for three or four years, just on transportation. So my my hope would be that somehow you all, you know, I'm visual, and I think everybody on the board, and it'll be a new board. So I don't know if our new members are uh, as visually centered as the, the previous board members. Have been, but we need to have a picture, and it needs to be to the to the street level. So I, I I hope that reassuring the community you're not going to be forced to change where you are, and I hope they would know that uh, you know maybe there's for high schools there's a legacy uh, point system too because so many of our folks go to the high schools that their moms and dads and grandparents went to. It's a, another weird thing about the city, but the the cost of choice um, is too much for us right now, but we have to, because the superintendent has said on a number of occasions in achievement, choice, or in finance, I think, choice is at the center of our offerings, so we don't want to lose that. So it would be great for whoever's on policy next year, or if it moves to a different committee, to see those attendance boundaries. Mr. Lindy? No, I, I think truly um, what I hear you saying, Eve, is uh, this would be really good information to be able to and not advocating and therefore we should do X or therefore we should do Y, but it's really important to be able to see is. I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, I think my, my only question is how much time does that take? Like, does it displace other things that you are doing that are more important than this? Can we sequence it in such a way that it is, you know, thoughtful with other work that's happening? But it, it feels like a, a really, I'm thinking too about a new superintendent, you know, you know and being able to see, um, you know. Yeah, I think the arrival of a, 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 a new superintendency, because we don't know who that person's going to be, falls in this. But I will also say we've lost how many years waiting and talking about it and not progressing. And there is general resistance to uncorking this particular Bottle, so to speak, um, and I, I think we'll have to. I don't think there's a transportation solution without doing this. I don't think there's a financial solution without doing this, uh, and yet it, it will take a great deal of effort. But I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Maybe there's not that much difference. Uh, but even the president of the uh, of board the other day told me, oh, my goodness, I didn't realize that my grandchild had to go to Mount to Airy, and they live in College Hill. Yes, that's that's silly. <laughs> he could walk, he could walk to the other. So there's a lot of effort there. Not to mention the Winton Terrace folks, the Winton Hills folks. They don't understand why they put their kids on a bus and it drives right past their school. And here we are saying, well, we need more parent involvement. Well, why don't you put our child's school in our neighborhood? I mean, just from our standpoint, uh, the, the question of digging into why parents choose our schools and why they don't, I, I, there's, it's, it's, I think, the most, one of the most important questions. Really. It, it's, it's certainly, I mean, Stephanie and I, it, it motivates us to uh, think about that and try to, challenge our current thinking. A PLT has had discussions about it. I, I will just say, you know, in, in talking with former folks who have worked on this previously, Sarah Trimble Oliver mm -hmm. and others, it, it's it's among the hardest things for a board to do. 
just so political, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited to work on it from our standpoint. And I'm so thrilled with that because I, that's what we need is the administration to be interested in it. And it's such a higher purpose and higher calling than most of what we do. And I, I don't, I get upset when any, a board member or anybody else says, well, it's all about race. Actually, I think it's mostly about poverty than anything else. Uh, well, you're going to send your child to a school where there is that much poverty and because they make assumptions totally incorrectly that those are underfunded schools. They are not underfunded schools or that there isn't great instruction. Whenever that's the major, there's greater instruction at our, 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 our schools that have such a high sense of poverty. And then, then, and this happened before at Walnut or any place else uh, with the achievements that, that the instructors are getting. So this is a big, it's a big thing, but if you could get those maps ready, and you said that on the website we can kind of do that a little bit. That would be great. Uh, and maybe it's an ad hoc committee too, so that all the other stuff that the committee has to do. There might have to be an ad hoc committee uh, uh, for transportation for three months too. So thank you. Sorry I added to all this time. It's going to be short. What else do you have? Uh, the, up to up to the the chair here, we've got um, the policy. I think there was an assignment to look at the hearing of the public process. Uh, I, I believe the chair added uh, transportation policy reviews. So we've got those policies, and then um, the internal auditor is here as well uh, on a couple of issues. Um, so glad to go wherever you'd like. Matt. Is it, uh, my understanding is that we've taken care of the public attending meetings. I uh, think general counsel sent a, a, a memo from PLT or a suggestion. And yeah, I think, was, sorry, yes, on the, on the attendance. I'm not sure on, that we've uh, updated the policy with respect to the hearing of the public. Okay. Um, I think that should fall to the new board. Okay. <laughs> The uh, the uh, public uh, uh, hearing of the public. So we've taken care of attending the board meetings, and we've even said what number of people can right. be in this place. And we seem to shift it most of all of our public stuff, rightfully so, to this place. And then the new one, we'll refer that to the new uh, uh, hearing of the public elsewhere. Right. And then before we get to the other, let's take care of our uh, internal auditor who is here to uh, talk to us a little bit about the. Audit Committee Charter as they met this week. It's been a very busy week for everybody. Uh, and um, she's going to update us on that. And then she's also going to update us on policy review. So here she is. Perhaps the most honest person in the entire district right here. We're counting on that. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for having me today. So we'll go ahead and begin, as Ms. Fulton said, with the review of the Audit Committee Charter Board Policy 6835. I believe they are in your packets, but I, I think uh, Mr. Hoyne is bringing around another copy as well. So you'll see, um, unfortunately, in the black and white version, you'll just have to refer to the underline or the strike through. Um, so a, the major changes to this uh, policy have come from uh, the need to more clearly document and outline the process for appointing the chair. Historically, the first chair that we had um, continued on for many, many years, and when he left the audit committee, it kind of raised the question of how do we go about appointing our chair? And since it is a, a community-led initiative and, and committee, we thought it would be beneficial to not just define it in process, but really to uh, ensure it is outlined in the policy itself. You'll see on the second page the section titled Audit Committee Chairs goes through and explains the process for appointing both the chair as well as the vice chair on an annual pro uh, cycle to follow the same process as the board's appointment of both the board president, vice president, and committee membership and, and chairs there. Um, we also go on to say the re responsibilities of the chair. And then ultimately another change uh, that was added to the policy was a required attendance in in-person meetings. I think with the switch uh, during the year between the COVID requirements of uh, teleconference and now requiring folks to be back in person to meet a quorum, um, the, the chair wanted to ensure folks were aware of their need now to attend in person. 
And then finally, on, on the first page, I, I was uh, I, think I missed saying that an addition they made was a requirement for all members to reside within the city of Cincinnati public school district boundaries. The idea of which would be the taxpayers are represented on our community membership. So I think that, uh, the audit committee moved and seconded uh, this these changes and requests your input and approval for these edits. Any questions I can answer? As uh, folks are reviewing that, uh, this has been before finance at least twice, mm -hmm. and it's been before the audit committee I think three times. Uh, and uh, uh, appreciate your work on this, and more particularly, uh, we just have to make sure that the language says that people have to reside in the district. Because a couple of times I heard in the audit meeting mm -hmm. uh, on Tuesday saying, oh, we have to live in the city. It, you have to live in the district. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and very frankly, um, we have a, a wonderful audit, community audit committee, uh, and it's fully um, peopled. Uh, with very diverse views, and uh, I just think it's been great through your leadership as well as the chairs of the audit committee that we've gotten where we've gotten. And um, uh, again, the legacy, if you will, from uh, Mrs. Bates. Um, she was one of the founding members of creating an audit committee for our district. Wendy? No, no objections or concerns. Can we be helpful for you on this in any way? So our hope is this is the final edit we bring to you <laughs> for a while. So I, I think we had this review pretty thoroughly now. And um, so if there are any items we're happy to add, but I think we feel pretty comfortable, we can let this lie for at least a few years now. Thank you. Well, then uh, without objection, we'll say that this is uh, our, we've approved the new charter, and I guess it goes back to the board uh, to approve it. Yeah, we'll approve it like another po any other policy. So. Will you will you uh, take care of that? We'll take it from there. Yep, okay, we, we have the red line in the point. So thank and you. Now, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. And, and then, now your review. Wonderful. So the other items that you have in front of you is a memo, and then I actually printed the attachment on legal size paper. Um, I think our general counsel has copies if you're interested. I will say before I start, attachment one on the legal paper is best viewed electronically, so I apologize for the size of the text but I think we'll cover things at a high enough level that it will still make sense. So for background for folks, especially those tuning in who may not be familiar, back in September, the Policy and Equity Committee asked Internal Audit to review four board policies that are listed here in this memo, uh, 2255 Equity, um, 2256 Anti-Racism, 2261.01, which is Parent and Family Engagement in Federal Programs, and then 6320, which is the purchasing of goods and services. So you can see outlined in the memo on the bottom of the second page, there are a series of uh, thorough questions that internal audit asked the administration or management as we refer to them in this memo. So our idea of, of interpreting the request from the committee was to say, what does the committee really want to know? And my thought on, and my team's thought on, on that request was, can we provide a pulse as to how far along and how implemented are these policies? And then in ask, asking these series of questions, we could say, what has been done so far? What do you plan to do? How do we measure this? How do we uh, collect data? And then ultimately, are there aspects of the policy that as the administration, the ones trying to implement, that um, perhaps could be updated or changed due to some sort of practicality issue? So through that conversation, we requested um, each, essentially, we broke down each component of the four policies, as you see in attachment one. And so I will kind of flip ahead here as well on the page two of the memo under the policy review summary. Do you can see in the table that's included, each area, each policy has various number of aspects. So what we mean by that is the requirement, number of requirements per policy. For example, the 2251 had 11 requirements that are broken out on attachment one. So we ask the series of questions for each component so we can get a sense of how far along in implementation is each specific section of the policy. So the evaluative criteria that we used, Mr. Lindy was uh, kind enough to guide us towards uh, being a bit more direct in our measurement of the policies. And so the evaluation criteria that we used was complete in the sense that the um, implementation has been fully implemented, fully executed. 
uh, in progress, meaning there is a sole owner and there is work that's being performed, but there is much work still to do. And then finally, the not started and not audible category was used when management was saying they haven't yet done something where there wasn't enough information to make a conclusion. So high level policies 2255 and 2256, as well as 6320, were much more straightforward when we came to the evaluation in that they were predominantly owned by one member of management or one department. So when we asked the questions, it was clear for them to give us a summary of where things stand. Conversely, 2261.01, we spoke to over 30 folks and still at the end of the day, um, weren't able to get a clear commitment as to who owns each aspect. I will say, take that with a grain of salt because I do believe that there is great work being done in these areas, but I think the recommendation on 2261.01 is for management to go through this exercise like we did. And instead of us asking who would like to be responsible, I think it would be beneficial for our superintendent and performance leadership team perhaps to encourage folks to be um, assign a sole owner and really go through this exercise internally. And so in terms of next steps, um, I think things that would be really helpful for this to be a more efficient process in the future is if we would like internal audit to evaluate a policy um, to work with management and request that they go through kind of a self-assessment of this nature. So we can see, is this policy um, being implemented? Do we know who we would speak to? And ultimately, is there data available for us to evaluate? But I think this is a great exercise. I think it allowed us to look at this in a little bit more granular detail than perhaps has been done in the past. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Lindy, I'm counting on you. <laughs> I will try very hard not to let you down, Ms. Bolt. Uh, this is where I lower everybody's expectations so I can hopefully exceed them. Go for um, it. Lauren, I just want to say that for particularly for the first time this has been done, this feels like an A to me. Uh, I have a bunch of things I want to talk about in here, but I don't want to miss the headline. And for you and for your team, I really want to say thank you. Um, uh, I think this, this stuff is not easy. It's never been done before. I just think it is so important that we check to see whether all the things we spend this time talking about actually do anything mm -hmm. in, the, in the lives of kids, in the lives of staff members, in the lives of families. Um, and uh, I think one of the, the, the lessons I learned in my last job where I was in charge of some internal audits was like a good internal audit finds things. So you can go do stuff about it. You know, like it, it's actually more concerning if like you, you, you don't really nothing so so i think it's wonderful that there's like some things that aren't started you know and some things that are in progress um i would be much more concerned if it came back and you know everything is great um because i've, I've never worked in an organization or seen an organization where there aren't things to work on it, it's just important to know what they are um so i just uh, particularly for a first time thank you um i think i wanted to, to start by just checking that i have the headlines right mm -hmm. Um, as, and I think that's the table summary you have in here. It matches exactly what we talked about. I find it very, very helpful. But I think my, my headline on this is there's a lot of work to do um, because there's actually almost nothing that is completely implemented. Um, and there are a number of things that aren't started yet. Um, and it, it, that's why I started with the A thing because that's still true. Like I, I, I think, but it just, it just shows there's real work to do. Um, and so one of the things that makes me think is um, I don't know that it needs to be every single one of these, but it does seem like in six months or a quarter, like, let's come back and see if things have gotten better. Um, because I, in, in then, I don't even know that I would have the expectation that everything would be complete. But if in three or six months, everything is exactly the same, I think that's a problem. Um, and so, so somewhere in, in next year's policy rhythm to have a way of returning to some things, and, and I, it, maybe it's a mix of returning to some of the old ones and adding one. We have to keep it manageable, mm -hmm. but I think like, to set up some kind of system whereby we check whether there's progress over time. Um, and then I think um, the other re uh, I had two other things. So, so um, uh, one of the reasons I think this conversation matters so much is I think as a committee, as a board, we need to be thoughtful about how many policies we're creating because I think we could create and create and create and create and create and create and that may or may not have anything to do with what's actually happening. 
And, and my, my, my hypothesis is we're going to get more effective impact if we focus on, on doing a smaller number of things really thoroughly um, as opposed to creating more. Um, I could be welcome to being challenged on that, but that, that's just a hypothesis I, I wanted to test, I think, with this whole process. Um, and then last, um, I thought maybe um, just to do like one example from here, uh, uh, I think is helpful for me and maybe for others. But on the, um, you know, one, one of the policies I, I worked on this year was this uh, updated to our bidder policies with the purchasing of goods and services. And so one of the things I noticed was that the, the paragraph that I worked with Dan and everybody on adding is this item 12 other requirements, I think. Uh, and this talks about from the very last page, basically requiring bidders to disclose whether or not they have things like um, a pension or retirement program, whether or not they've maintained an apprenticeship program that's registered with the Ohio State Apprenticeship Council. I, I, am I I'm reading this right that it's not started yet? That's correct. So in working with um, Ms. Levins, our Director of Fiscal Services, she was very candid in uh, the status with us, which we really appreciated. And she was very quick to say that there's a lot of work to be done. So sure. she, um, yes, she said that they have not yet begun that section yet. It's, it's part of why I think this process matters, because I think that was six months ago. You know, it's not like it was six days ago. Um, and it just makes me, I don't, I don't know this person. This could be the most talented person working in the district. So no, no, I would want to learn more. But um, I, the question I'm asking myself is if this hadn't happened and six more months had gone by, would it still be in the not started mm -hmm. category? You know, uh, and so that's just why I think this really matters. Uh, and I think it's so good what you all have uncovered. Um, my, my request would just be that we, we, this doesn't become a one-time thing, um, but that we maintain some commitment to checking whether or not the policies are actually being implemented. Thank you for the feedback. I, I completely agree. And so I think maybe in terms of next steps, if I could ask something of this committee, uh, would be that if we want to continue periodically updating, if the request could come directly from the committee to the administration, I think that might help incentivize and uh, kind of uh, encourage uh, expeditious participation. Um, and that way, if we would like them to report back maybe in six months, now that they have a clearly defined template, internal audit can assist. But I think if we could get a bit more of an assignment versus us asking who would like to be uh, assigned to these things or who would like to take accountability, it might expedite the process. Can, um, can you just say that one more? My brain works really yes. slowly. So I essentially, sure I, I think the issue that we ran into very direct is when we went through this process with general counsel kind of advised that this may be a bit of a challenge is when we ask folks who is our point of contact for this specific aspect of the policy, um, folks can be a little hesitant to want to put their name on it. So rather than us asking who should we speak to and who would like to take this on, perhaps if it was a bit more management led coming down from the superintendent and PLT to say that this team and please provide an answer, I think it would go a little bit more efficiently. Oh, I think that's critical. You know, like I, I would, the thing I was listening for was, are, were you asking for that to come from us? Correct. Yes. Well, I, I don't think that, I think it needs to come from the superintendent. Of the yes. Agreed. Um, like they're, they're, they're in charge of running the show. Uh, yeah. I think what we're going to do is check that the show is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Um, and so I think I would just, I would like, um, I think we need to figure out lots of things like what's the next date? What's the next scope? Mm -hmm. But like whenever we get there, my request to you would be to ask to check with the superintendent interim or who to say like, hey, this is coming up. Here's what we saw last time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm worried we're going to have the same kind of thing unless it's really clear who's in charge. Absolutely. Um, can we get your help with that? Okay, perfect. That makes sense. Thank you for all that time, Ms. Bolden. No, no uh, thank you for taking all the time. Um, like part of the um, part of the reality of board versus, if you will, administration is that a significant amount of time is spent um, avoiding some things that the board says and sometimes uh, getting right to it. And it's, it's hard to know how to make that connection or that liaison. Uh, I don't think I disagree with that. I don't know that the new board, the new policy committee needs to add very many more. 
until we see some more significant progress than this. Mm -hmm. And to the point that we met, I mentioned before, it's very frustrating. If people say, what do you need to be on the board? I said, you have to be persistent. Be helpful if you're visionary, but most importantly, keeping it on the agenda is a full-time job because it's oh good that month is over we don't have to do that anymore or something so i think um uh, i think uh, it's good that the internal auditor person is able to say this is what the policy committee is demanding what the board wants and then to your point the superintendent has to say well then well, this is a priority and i think that's why it was good that we selected the particular policies that we did and to your point I know we have some reservations about the cycle and recycling and, you know, getting through the whole list. We may have, we did need to do that. I don't know if we have to keep doing that every year as much as, when we, remember when we made that list of substantive policies that actually affect board work versus the procedural kinds of policies? I think a recommendation to the new policy committee would be, why don't you concentrate on the substantive? Because that's that's really where that's board work. This other is um, administration work. So I think there's some good things that we can pass on to the new. I hope at least somebody from the current policy committee is able to stay on there. But we never know that till the night that we all vote. So there you go. Yes, sir. I was just going to say to offer. I think I agree with everything you said, Ms. Bolton, and to offer some empathy. I think for the administration. But we may find that it is physically impossible to get all of these things to happen. That's really important information for us to know because it means we have too many policies. Um, I didn't mean to point at Dan like it's his fault. It's not, <laughs> I don't think it's Dan's fault. Um, but but um, if that's true, we got to trim back. We have to we have to create the conditions for you all to really focus on the things that matter most. Um, and so I do I do I'm, I wanted to just be clear that this this hopefully we'll feel like a two-way conversation as we go forward um, because I think it you know if things aren't implemented it, it that just is the next question so why not and independent and, and it could be lots of different whys um, some whys might mean we just need to do that some whys might mean like we can't pull this off right now we have to be clear about what our priority is. absolutely and, and oh pardon me and I was just going to add that general counsel and internal audit had some great discussion around um, those cycle reviews that you all do with the policies and just be really mindful of, you know, when the purchasing policy comes through, deeply involving purchasing to give that feedback uh, as a subject matter experts as well. Yeah, that, that's what, if, if I may, that the ownership I was going to add it, and what I'll take from Ms. Bates uh, and her, her sort of tenure, she spent a lot of time on policy committee and one of her pet peeves, if you will, was, to ensure that there was somebody from policy committee from the administration side that was making sure that the administration was, you know, updating procedures, informed of what was going on. And that's on on uh, on me. And so, uh, you know, I think we could do better there. And, and uh, you know, Ms. Bates's voice will always be in my head about you know, making sure we carry that back. So um, we, we have some ownership in this as well. Right. Excellent. And again, everybody in the administration in the district knows that you report to the board and you report to the audit committee. That is to whom you report. And that should carry some opportunity for you to uh, have that kind of independence mm -hmm. and also uh, 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 some sense of uh, uh, respect that you're going to be a, a fair uh, arbiter of what's going on. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you for all the time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Lundy? Hey. Hey, okay. Uh, let's skip down, if we could, to, uh, again, the, I think we all did sort of the close contact curriculum in our previous, dis in our discussion, didn't we? You started to talk about the ICANN and our kids being placed in career uh, situations. And then I know we want to talk about the uh, athletic outbreaks. So let's put those two together and whatever you didn't get to say when we first discussed it. What Dan is uh, passing out right now is information that was provided to us from our COVID task force. Um, it's pretty much just kind of demonstrating a snapshot 
um, of how currently right now um, the district attempts to kind of track hot spots and outbreaks. Um, what they do is they track them for grade, for school, and if there's more than 10% of a grade that is positive, it's flagged it as red. Um, if it falls between 5 to 10%, it's flagged it as yellow. And so pretty much they watch that really closely. Um, it's not a perfect measure, but they do try to analyze um, based on school size, grade size, and even classroom size. Um, but it's not really a baseline per se. Um, but what they attempt to do is even in the, because I was asking, and even in the snapshot that was provided, we have two Hayes Porter's grades. One is in yellow at 8.11%, mm. and one is um, the fifth grade is at 11.43%. But what was kind of the difference of approach, um, you know, that those schools were receiving based on this kind of color coding? Um, but they were quick to share that there's a lot of anecdotal information that becomes involved. They work with um, epidemiology at the health department to really try to determine what are the factors that are causing kind of these to be hot spots. And what they have found is sometimes when they look anecdotally that there's sometimes still not necessarily a need necessarily close the classroom or close the school because, of course, we want to keep as many kids in school as possible. But they may find that there was a specific source you know, for the for the hot spot, maybe there was a class sleepover or something. So then it's a matter of re-educating that class on, you know, proper protocols and things of that nature. Or sometimes what they've been finding is that, you know, school size or class size is not really even indicative, even though there's a percentage there, because it might be lingers and things of that nature during the same class. So, they, so this is really, they were just trying to demonstrate that there is a process that they're using to try to identify kind of those close, mm -hmm. close contact hot spots and outbreaks. But there's kind of a lot of factors that um, that are reviewed in order to determine when they actually would maybe close a class and have a class go remote or a school in that nature. So they were just hoping this snapshot would provide well, at least some framework. This is very interesting. Lindy? Good. Good. Thank you. And then as far as athletics, there was a chart that was included in your packet, which would also, again, um, similar tracking information, again, which, again, I was very impressed with um, how all of our departments are doing a good job and, you know, trying to track information to keep our students as safe as possible. But this is um, the athletics chart that they keep. Um, this was specifically for the fall season. They wanted us to make sure that we reminded the committee of that because now for winter sports, they'll be doing the test to play kind of procedure. But so this was prior to um, that mechanism being in place. But it just, again, just demonstrating um, how many students, if they paused the program, if they didn't pause the program, and again, sometimes anecdotal information um, comes into play. Um, but on the chart, which although it's in black and white for you, there are certain um, dates which have kind of like a color coding system. And this is instances where multiple positive student athletes were on the team, and all of those resulted in a team pause. But it also was another way for them to kind of highlight if there was a specific spread or a hot mm -hmm. spot that they needed to address other than just the regular close contact approach. If I could just add to that, in talking to Mr. Harden, I, I wanted to give you a sense of how uh, the mask to stay, test to play guidelines have uh, really been an improvement for us. And, and uh, oh, good. so, in one, you see all these teams that were on pause during the first quarter before uh, we had implemented uh, mask to stay, test to play. Obviously, those programs are now allowed to continue, mm -hmm. but but the more important um, impact is is twofold. One, it, when when we had a kid who became a close contact because of an out of school activity, including athletics, they were also required to quarantine at home. They weren't allowed to quarantine in school. Those kids are now allowed and able to quarantine in school, which is much better. Huge. The sec the second really um, important. Uh, piece is that because they have to test the play, and we we have provided that testing. We have at, at home tests that we administer to you know, you know if there's a if there's a positive case on a basketball team, and the play, student athletes have consented to testing, we we take care of the testing for them. We've uncovered some non symptomatic unsymptom uh, asymptomatic positive cases of students who you know, otherwise would not have known that they were positive and could have contributed to a spread. So two really positive impacts, lots more kids able to stay in school because of that policy. And second, we're uncovering more asymptomatic positive cases to ensure that those students are quarantined and not spreading it. 
So I'm really very pleased with that. Nice to stay. Uh, yeah, um, I think this is really good and helpful to see. I, I do have some follow-up questions, but the thing I'm not remembering is um, how this got on the agenda. Was, it, was there a particular reason we were um, that it, I think it's good. I'm glad we're talking about it. I wouldn't talk about it anyway. I just can't remember why we had it on here. I think it came out of the discussion we were having again about the subset of vaccination if we were going to determine if we needed. Oh, subset. so if, if, if parents were, were really against all students being vaccinated, right. what about like subset the target? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then we wanted some information about, about I got it. I got it. Um, I got it. I think so. This is, this is a related issue. Yeah, but I think if, if it's too off topic, please tell me. But I think um, I've heard at least some concerns about um, indoor sports, COVID precautions in a way game. So, you know, here's a here's a family that is used to CPS, where in CPS, all the gyms are at half capacity. Everybody's in a mask. Anybody who's not on the court playing wears a mask. Goes to another team, place is full. 100% capacity, nobody's wearing a mask. Other teams aren't, so the kids are less likely to do it because they see nobody else do it. Um, and now intuitively, that's concerning. Uh, I think um, often intuition is wrong, you know, and I think that, that we, you all are, are there smart people working on this and thinking about this, and I'm sure this issue has come up. Um, so I, what I was hoping was just to hear a little bit about like, why should we feel okay about sending kids and families to away games like that? Or do we not know and we need to go find out or um, something else? Yeah, so I, it certainly is a concern. Uh, the, the one thing I'd say is it's not a new concern. So last year we dealt with the same kind of questions because at a time when our schools were fully remote, we restarted athletics and we were competing against uh, other school districts that had chosen to go back uh, in person um, uh, and again utilize different protocols I, we, we don't control and we, we don't have the jurisdiction to decide what what other schools are using as their protocols both for you know preventing the spread within the school and then also you know what they're deciding to do in terms of spectators and and mask requirements um, you know so we we uh, mandate that our teams follow our protocols wherever we go. But again, not much we can do about other schools. Um, I think the balance and the trickiness, it, it, I will also add one more thing. We, we have had on very rare occasions information that's come to us that has concerned us about the safety of our student athletes. This happened last year, a couple of occasions where we learned that there might be a positive player on the other team. And it, where we had questions, we went as far as pulling the team at times. Um, didn't happen very often, but there were a few situations where uh, we, we decided not to not to play. Um, the, the balance and the di difficult balance again. We don't control what their their school protocols are. In order for our kids to compete in interscholastic athletics, it, it, you know, it, it, you can't do that just with our schools. It, you know, we tried that uh, for a time last year, I think, with our football team doing just a CPS league. Um, but, but again, that's not really competing, you know, in, in o OHSAA kind of interscholastic athletics. So that, that's the balance. Yeah, and I think like the the I I get the trade off, and I think um, you know the skeptic would say. Um, sure, but I can't imagine a worse place to be than a gymnasium shoulder to shoulder with people screaming with masks off, you know, in the middle of an Omicron wave. Um, and, and as I'm thinking through that concern, which I think is not, I don't think that's irrational or unreasonable. Right? The, the, the question I, I'm trying to answer for myself is, um, when, when we're consulting with whether it's county, or children's or whomever, um, uh, you know, how are they advising us on how to think through the trade-offs of that? Does that make sense? Because like what we were saying, like the, the value of interscholastic competition is so great that we're willing to run the risks associated with, with having kids and families in that environment. And I think my, my, my assumption that I wanted to just test is that, and that's because 
We've looked at the data. We've looked at what happened last year. We run these policies by our public health experts, and they, they think that's a reasonable um, trade-off to make. I just wanted to check that that's right. <laughs> I mean, I certainly, uh, I, I think those conversations are being held. I'm not necessarily part of the conversations with the health department. I, I also think families who decide to have their kids participate in interscholastic athletics, it, 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 they know what the schedule is going to be. So, so to some extent, they know that they'll be going to school districts that may or may not have the same or similar protocols that we have. So families are able to make that choice as well as it, it, certainly the, the, the board has the ability to make a different choice for the district as a whole. But, um, the, you know, the, there is some it, families are also making that choice I think, by determining to allow their is it, last thing, I, I promise. Okay. Is, is it possible to get an, um, it doesn't have, uh, it could be live, it could be in the form of a memo or an email or something, but like something from the public health experts that we're working with on this question of like, um, full maskless gyms during basketball season, during away games. Just, I, what I want to do is confirm that we're not doing something right. Yeah, we can ask. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, to, to follow up on that, um, if, if the athletic event is happening in our facility, if the athletic event is happening in our facility, the um, opponents, are they having to live by our standards? That's right. Yes, they yes. do. Okay. And I've heard a little bit about enforcement, too, uh, that it, it seems kind of loosey-goosey, that it might be depending upon who the AD is or who the principal is or whatever, I mean, the school AD. So I, I do think it might be a good thing if we start the next year, uh, calendar year, it might not be a bad idea to, to reinforce that there's an expectation that our rules are going to be enforced. If if we know um, if somebody's COVID on the other team, do we report that to uh, the Ohio Athletic Association? I don't know if it's the Ohio Athletic Association. It's it's been reported to us by, for example, like a trainer on the other. We'll call our trainer. That that's the situation that I was familiar with. We had a trainer report that to us. Um, are you saying like a, as a sanctionable kind of event? Well, they're not. They shouldn't be eligible. Yeah. I, I, they shouldn't be playing. I understand. I I, I can look into whether that was. Seventeen pages of eligibility rules. The Ohio High, the High School Athletic Association, and I, I don't like to be punitive about these things, but uh, this is going to keep going on for a while, and I just think that that's a that's an issue of eligibility. Um, which I just wanted to know, and and then at our uh, facilities, do we have enough? Uh, I've seen this happen. We do have at every entrance um, masks available, correct? I believe so, but I can double check. No, I mean, I've seen it, but I've, uh, I just want to make sure that we're going into the winter. You're, the expectation that our rules are followed even by visiting teams Absolutely. is, is correct. And we, we can double down on enforcement of that, but, uh, that you have the correct understanding of what, what our expectation is exactly. and what the athletic department's expectation And who's ever at that door? Or getting their ticket or going in, they yeah. need if they don't have a mask, we need to give them one. That's right. Now it could say I think all of them should say, Go CPS and forget the rest of you or we're the best and then make them wear it. <laughs> I, I actually I think that'd be a good idea, but <laughs> what did you say? No, I was just saying you forget your mask. This is your penalty. You, know, <laughs> you get to become one of our fans. So. I love it. Okay, great. Um, another uh, issue before we do this transportation, because that's really a handout kind of thing. Um, do we have some policies that you're proposing? I see some red lines. On the transportation? No, no. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, on new policies? Yeah. Or, or our re regular review? Yes. Sure. Are there two of them, or I the think same? I've got four. I can do as many as you'd like. Well, let's do all of them fast. You got it. Um, let me. 
these are uh, for uh, transfer and assignment. Yeah, so this and was then one discipline. Yep. Uh, the first one is assignment and transfer. I'm going to try to share. Let's see if I assignment and transfer. It was discussed at uh, last board, uh, last policy committee meeting. Uh, there was a request uh, to add um, the language from the Ohio Revised Code that relates to uh, administrators not being transferred during the life of their contract to a position of a lesser responsibility. That comes straight from the Ohio Revised Code 3319.02. And then as well to uh, ensure that all employees' uh, transfers should be consistent with their collective bargaining agreement and the best interest of schools. We've added that language. Uh, I welcome you questions. Again, while we're doing that, I'm going to try to bring up some of these policies. Those at home can also. Any questions on 3130? No, I think that's a, 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 that's an improvement, at least from my perspective. Are you okay with it, Mr. Lindy? Yes. What's the next one, Dan? We'll move that forward. Uh, the next Please. is 3132 uh, that relates to uh, vacancies within the school district. Um, I had no recommended changes on policy. Glad to answer your questions. Lindy? No questions. Next one. Okay. Uh, so next and that change. one can move forward too. Yep. Uh, no changes there. Next is 3139 that relates to employee discipline. Um, bring that up as well. Uh, the recommended changes here is uh, uh, just to add a reference to progressive discipline. Uh, that's that's really a part of any any kind of discipline that uh, the district engages in. It's, it's uh, almost an inherent implied term at this point in collective bargaining agreements. Uh, and of course, in egregious cases, uh, you, you know you could move uh, more quickly. Um, but some cleanup changes there, but uh, not not really anything else. Glad to answer your questions on it. Mr. Lindy, I'm happy with it. Are you happy? No, I think it's great. Thank you. Okay. Dan? Okay, we'll move that forward. And lastly is 3140 relating to termination uh, and resignation of employees. Uh, again, a little bit of cleanup, uh, but also um, a couple of new references. One is, um, and, and this, uh, if you recall, we are combining, again, the 4140. So, so it, it, a reference that was in 4140 but wasn't previously in 3140 is that an employee's resignation, once accepted by the board, may not be rescinded. And second, we added uh, just a short paragraph to set to remind employees, and this, is, this actually comes from state law and also uh, the educator's professional code, that an educator cannot resign after July 10th uh, without without showing good cause. So that, that's to maintain the stability of a learning environment. It, you know, for a teacher, a classroom teacher to resign the day before school starts, the week into the school year, um, weeks into the school year is is considered a, it's not only a violation of their, their uh, contract, and it's, it's uh, potentially an ethical violation as well. And thought this was a good place to add. Glad to answer your question. That's a good idea, Mr. Lindy. Sounds good to me. We'll move those forward. That's all we have on. And I think review. that you all moving those forward for the January board meeting uh, would then complete this policy committee's uh, list. Uh, I think fairly well, and uh, get the next policy committee started well. And before we move this. Transportation piece, uh, I just want to remind ourselves that we're sending to the next policy committee the discussion regarding hearing of the public processes. That should be their call, not our, ours necessarily. And that there be some sort of routine discussion and sharing regarding the policies under review that the uh, internal auditor presented to us. To, and, the, and the new policy committee figuring out what that might be in association with the superintendent and internal auditor. Is that correct? Is there anything else That's that good. we have? Oh, and uh, the other piece before we move on and close out is that the hope that we will see visually uh, the boundary lines, attendance 
lines, that would be helpful. Great. Um, and we've gotten through the close contact. I think, check me, I think we've gotten through what we need to except for the transportation. Uh, let me uh, just uh, open with that and hand some things out uh, for uh, for in interest. If I could, General Counsel and Assistant General Counsel. As you uh, pointed out to us, uh, 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 a couple of, uh, well, actually, probably three months ago, there were three transportation policies that are in play. One is supervision of transported students, one is transport, transportation of students, and one is transportation by district contracted vans. Appreciated that. Uh, for the public's knowledge, um, one of these policies goes back to World War II. Now, we've reviewed it occasionally, but not very often. Uh, and um, it is uh, in need of, I think, revision as one member of the policy committee. The other one that for contracted vans, we have become very much more dependent upon contracted vans. And there are all kinds of rules and regulations about contracted vans, how many kids and what kind of maintenance and whatever, and had the opportunity to read some of that stuff that is part of the ODE requirements regarding transportation. And then the more generic, which is just talking about transportation of students. Um, I shared with my uh, policy uh, members a couple of weeks ago some musings that I had about the policies in those three areas because they've come up in uh, in finance as well as here because transportation is in finance. So all I'm asking is for general counsel, if, I, if Mr. Lindy, if Mr. Morawski had said it would be okay, I know he did, uh, if general counsel can just look at these three, maybe be able to, for whatever is the new policy committee, answer some of these questions or queries, if you will, as well as have a much more expansive view of what transportation is. Not surprisingly, we've seen for, for almost 80 years uh, in the district, and um, being in this history here, for almost 80 years, we've only seen it as our regional transportation system and us having a private vendor cadre of yellow bus. A thousand years ago, <laughs> in, on the west side, it was Kissel Brothers that were the major vendors. And I think there may have been rigs and whatever that maybe were only two vendors on Yellow Bus, but they had huge fleets. The, that many years ago, there were 80,000 children in this district. That many years ago, there were over 100 and some schools in the district. So it's a very different situation. But I think it would be a good practice for us to look at being more expansive about what transportation is. And I think uh, even thinking more environmentally and instructionally. Uh, and also the new wrinkle might be that indeed, and this is coming a little bit out of finance and some of the work that the administration has done, that maybe there will need to be some kind of CPS, not huge fleet, but specialized fleet for not just quantitative reasons, but also for qualitative reasons. So. Uh, just tried in those musings and thoughts to look at those three policies and see if indeed the, the new policy committee begins. Because whatever we do with transportation, which I think is going to be a completely different plan than what we used to, is going to require different policy. And to the chagrin of the general counsel, I keep saying that we're being forced by our vendors to operate outside of our own policy. And so these are all kind of interrelated. So if I just take the opportunity to look through those and give us some advice, give us some counter arguments and, and have a place where we can begin a discussion in the new policy committee for the, this coming year. Mr. Lindy, your approval, sir? I mean, it sounds great, and I, I think I just like a lot of the questions that you're asking on, on the document, and I don't, I think they feel really important, and I don't know the answers to them. Um, but for example, uh, who is responsible for our students during transportation transfers? Um, 
when routes are run late and students are charging a school or late home, who's responsible for their safety as they wait for the next bus? Uh, I just think those, I also think, um, I think there are going to be two kinds of answers to that question. There's going to be the legal who is technically responsible, and then there's going to be who the parents look to. Uh, and I think parents are going to look to us regardless oh, yeah. of what the legal answer is. And so whatever plan we have in place, I think it needs to address both of those issues. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong, but that's my prior coming in. I think you're absolutely right. And I, you know, even the way the current policies read, uh, parents are responsible for a whole lot and we are responsible for some and nobody's responsible in this transfer piece. I mean, unless legally it's considered one wrong, but the, the actual language doesn't even talk about them. So, and this ties into the neighborhood schools and what have you. So appreciate the, the efforts that people will make in looking through this. And there is a, it is sort of time sensitive. It isn't something that's to wait till the end of the year. It needs to be something in the next few months. It would seem to me because it could impact even what's coming out of finance and what's coming out of policy could impact what, what RFP we have or what plan we have or what contracts or whatever with the other vendors or what role Metro is going to play and assuming their rightful public responsibility that they are currently denying. Any, any, uh, if that does, if that's okay with that, then we have other. Is there anything other to raise either from general counsel or Mr. Lindy or the administration? Not from us. Great. Me either. Uh, the only other would be to wish people a happy holiday. But before we do that, do we have any members of the public that need to speak? We have no requests from online. None? None. Well, happy holidays. And I think anybody that gets to serve on the policy committee next uh, year and this coming month uh, benefits greatly from the administrators that are our liaison, our advisors. And uh, to the reference that uh, Mr. Morosky made about the good work of this committee, I can tell you I've I've been on the committee several different times, seldom consecutively, but I think we've done some very big work and done it well. I appreciate his chairmanship, Mr. Lindy's membership, but most particularly, I really value uh, the administration's work throughout because you've met every deadline and dealt with us uh, in, a, in a very special way that you always do. Thank you and happy holidays to everybody. Thank you very we much. Are